Good evening and welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news on CNC3. I'm Ria Rambali. I'm Ryan Bechu. I am Jassy Murik with Sports. And I'm Kalein Hussein with your weather. Let's tell you what's making the news tonight. South farmers rescue livestock from flood waters following overnight rains. Fake documents flagged at the Shigonis Borough Corporation. Now one worker is receiving threats. Hours to go before Tobago Carnival. Police tell revelers to be careful as crime on the island is on the rise. The Gymnastics Federation faces up to the harsh realities ahead as the Tamer Williams issue is finally settled. Its president says there is a role in the rebuilding process for the former gymnast. Multiple alerts remain in effect for Trinidad and Tobago as we head into the weekend with more rainfall on the horizon into next week. I'll have the details on what we can expect in tonight's weather forecast. Farmers were forced to wade through floodwaters to rescue livestock as overnight rains triggered flooding in several parts of Penal, Debe and Barakpo. The rising waters posed problems for people in the lowest areas of the South Oropooch drainage basin. And even though a heavy-duty pump operated at the Tulsa Trace picnic site, it was not enough to channel the water flow. Ivan Tulsi ventured into the flooded zones today and Radhika De Silva tells us more. This breach in the South Oropooch River caused the devastation in woodland over the past two days. Well, it started coming up yesterday, and well, last time we found out that the river versus banks again, so I don't know many times, and again the water has come up, and it is a very frustrating situation. It happens time and time and time again. The residents used the private submissible pumps to drain their properties. When we visited the pump house at the Tulsa Trace picnic site, it appeared to not be in operation, although it had been working the night before. President of the South Oropooch Riverine Flood Action Group, Edward Moody, says this is unacceptable. The people are fed up. Get the pump on, get the crew in place, put on the pumps and let it work and take this water out. The river bank has breached in that area, right? This is nine times in three months. For God's sake, it will take nothing out of you guys to bring in our floating excavator and repair that piece of the bank. Look, we are farmers. Up to last night, they were taking their cows out of the water. This livestock farmer says he has no choice but to wade through the waters. We're going to cross them in the river and put them up in the road somewhere. So yesterday we come in the evening, the water did not breach the bank up. So it is already dark already. That was about six after six. We couldn't move them and bring them anywhere higher. So check what's going on. From yesterday evening, about five o'clock, six o'clock, this water crossing and real, with real pace. Check this morning. That water is about four feet almost from yesterday evening till this morning. And this farmer says it's a risk he has to take. What you went out there to do? Eh? What you went outside there to do? Well, you see I've gone and bring out my animal, right? Mm -hmm. If you can swim good, you do take that chance. Yeah. But I know I could hold my hands. He says he has already faced livestock losses in the past. They're cramping, drunk and dead. Look, you see where I bull there? Right across there, one of my big heifer. About, say about eight to nine thousand dollars. Just so the water was. He just gone down the bank there. I don't know how. When I come from home, I watching, I see the thing walking in the bank up and when I come, I see the thing down drunk already. When contacted, Works Minister Rohan Sinanan told the CNC3 News that excessive rainfall will always pose problems in the South Oropooch drainage basin. He says that the HAC 330 pump installed at Tulsa Trace has the capacity to remove 53 million gallons of storm water within a 24-hour period. Sinanan says the pump has been operational. Radhika De Silva, CNC3 News. Now, the Southwest Regional Health Authority is tonight assuring patient care is not compromised at the San Fernando General Hospital. A video circulating on social media shows a man lifting a nurse on his back while pushing a patient on a wheelchair through a flooded section of the hospital. However, the SWRHA says the incident was isolated to only one section of the hospital. It assures it is working diligently with partner agencies to find a permanent solution to this problem. Faisabad MP Lakram Bodo says the incident is a reflection of the government neglecting to maintain aging infrastructure. He says despite billions of dollars spent on the sector since 2015, the government continues to fall short in providing satisfactory health care for citizens. 
The landslip near Timital Junction, San Francisco, has worsened overnight. Just yesterday, residents protested, calling for assistance to address the collapsing land, which is now threatening their homes. But according to residents, heavy rains and vehicular traffic have worsened the situation as the roadway is now beginning to collapse into the cavity. They, re they are renewing their calls for the government to intervene before it is too late. So Trinidad and Tobago entered its fourth day of inclement weather as heavy rainfall overnight pushed some major rivers across the Trinidad, across Trinidad and burst its banks. Meanwhile, in Tobago, multiple roads became impassable due to flooding and landslides. With an adverse weather alert and riverine flood alert still in effect, Colleen Hussein is standing by with the latest. Colleen, are rivers on the decline tonight? And that is probably the best news we can hear. And yes, they are all on the decline according to the latest data from the Water Resources agency through the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. So let's take a look at those river levels because the Upper Kyrene River Basin has finally dropped below its 100% capacity. It's at 99.5%. You know it doesn't sound like much but it is on the decline. We will be seeing the Lower Kyrene River Basin rise occasionally through the next 24 hours. In the North Arapooch River as well it has crested and has begun to decline but across the Kyrene River Basin, North Arapooch River Basin and even the South Arapooch River Basin, all of these tributaries Terries to these major rivers remain at capacity or already overflowing their banks. So we still have these alerts in effect through tomorrow, and that means more flooding is still possible with isolated showers. Now, taking a look at where flooded today, the Kyrene River actually overtopped near Greenvale. The Kyrene River is in the back here. This here is a retention pond, and water was kept out of the Greenvale community because of this elevated levee that was built after the 2018 floods. Now we saw flooding also occur at the Kyrene River at the Uriah Butler Highway, but water was contained within its large levees. You can see here, uh, these are shots that you would have seen if you're driving along the north or southbound lanes of the Uriah Butler Highway in the vicinity of Bamboo Number no. 3. But the Kyrene River wasn't the only river that flooded this uh, over the last 24 hours. We saw flooding across the Vega de Arapuch area. That's from the North Arapooch River and its tributaries flooding, sending floodwaters into homes. And also across the South Arapooch River, where a number of tributaries into this major river that extends 30 kilometers inland, bringing water from Maruga all the way to the Gulf of Paria. It reached its threshold levels at about 90% capacity based on eyewitness reports. Now, as we head through the next couple of days, we will continue to see more rainfall. And this is not good news, especially for Tobago, dealing with over 50 reports of inclement weather, causing multiple landslides you can see here at Idlewild in Tobago. And they also dealt with flooding. Number of rivers burst their banks overnight, with flooding continuing today. This here is along Providence Road in Tobago. And we'll continue to report on the number of incidents that will continue to unfold over the coming days and even into next week with more rainfall on the horizon. I'll tell you what we can expect later in the newscast. All right, thank you so much, Kaleem. Well, police are tonight investigating death threats against a worker at the Shaguanas Borough Corporation. They say it's linked to the discovery of fraudulent documents. That's right, Rhea. CNC3 News understands that officials found several fake buildings completion certificates of properties in central Trinidad. Otto Carrington tells us more. The building inspector at the Shogonas Borough Corporation is said to receive death threats after he unearthed a scheme of forged documents and approvals which allegedly occurred before he took office. The current building inspector reportedly told the council meeting that he received death threats by phone call. The nexus behind the threats comes from allegations that a real estate developer was given a building completion certificate for parcels of land with no building approvals, no town and country approvals, and no approval from the chief medical office. The saga started when a legal letter was sent to the Shogonas Borough Corporation from one of the persons who was interested in purchasing one of the properties. The letter was dated June 18, 2021, from an attorney at Hobson Legal. It asked to verify the authenticity of the building completion certificate. Guardian Media, CNC3 News, was able to get our hands on a copy of the letter and emails between attorneys and the corporation's former building inspector, but the emails never authenticated the documents. CNC3 News also obtained copies of two of the alleged building completion certificates, which were issued on October 11, 2020. The document bears the signature of the Shogonas Borough Corporation, former chief executive officer, former building inspector and former engineer. CNC3 News also obtained minutes from the Streets Buildings and Development Committee. 
The minutes of the meeting detail the request from the attorney and the response from the then building inspector, Mr. Michael Guelmo. He stated the attached to this correspondence is a completion certificate signed by himself, the engineering and surveying officer, and the chief executive officer. He further stated that the top of the document was true, but the bottom of it was false. Therefore, this was a fraudulent document. He suggested that a copy of this letter be sent to the municipal police and the fraud squad. He added that the certificate registration number for 4240 was not for the name Mr. Mahindra Budram and the site Jonathan. And trace Kunupia Shogonas. He further added that the application number was not for this application, nor was the tongue and country number accurate either. The matter was raised again in the statutory council meeting yesterday. Council members were reportedly in shock that the issue was taken off the minutes and the matter was never sent to the fraud squad. CNC3 News contacted Shogonas Mayor Faik Mohammed. He said that he is aware of the matter and it was an active investigation and the matter will be referred to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. He declined to say more. CNC3 News obtained numbers for the name on the certificate, however, none of the numbers work. The current building inspector and the corporation chief executive officer are called to send official correspondence to law enforcement on the matter. Otto Carrington, CNC3 News. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley and five members of his cabinet have been ordered to appear before a High Court judge next month. Justice Devendra Rampasad made the order earlier today as he granted Gary Griffith leave to pursue a judicial review lawsuit to block the laying of an audit report into the police's firearms department in Parliament. In his court filings obtained by CNC3 News, the former police commissioner claims that the terms of reference for the investigative committee were never revealed. He further claims he was never contacted or interviewed before committee members members completed its investigations. Through the lawsuit, Griffith is seeking a series of declarations over the committee and an order quashing the report or aspects which deals with his performance as police commissioner between 2018 and last year. The parties are scheduled to appear before Justice Rampasad on November 9th. The Housing Development Corporation has confirmed that while preliminary works are ongoing along Todd Street in San Fernando, concerns from stakeholders will be addressed, responding to issues raised by residents, property owners, business leaders and school principals. The HCC said a land audit exercise was ongoing to determine the suitability for housing. Nearly 100 people raised concerns and said the proposed development will decimate the area's green space impact drainage, increase traffic congestion, and prevent the reconstruction of two schools. The HDC assured that traffic management engineers, along with representatives from Town and Country's planning division, will be engaged last week. Now, last week, Pandit Rudranath Maharaj raised the concerns with the HDC development while addressing worshippers. As concerns continue over child abuse in the country, the National Children's Registry is launched. Minister of Gender and Child Affairs in the Office of the Prime Minister, Ayanna Webster-Roy, believes this will help save children's lives. In fact, she says if the registry had been fully operational, then Mackenzie Hope Roche, who was strangled to death by her mother in August, could have been alive today. You see, the fact that she wasn't going to school might have triggered an alert. A wellness check is needed at that family. So, maybe Division Ministry of Education, Interactive Ministry of Social Development, prompting family services to go in. Maybe we might have been able to save Mackenzie Hope. Well, the minister also said the system will prevent the need for a children's authority since matters of concern can be detected in the early stages and avoided. The NCR is a government date management, data management and sharing system that would serve as a secure holding information on children in the country. Well, there's a saying, the only thing that rain stops is cricket. And this was true for the Tomac Festival in Tobago last night. Certainly right, Rhea. The event was headlined by Nigerian sensation Burna Boy. And for those who braved the inclement weather, it was a moment to remember. Here's more from Vindra Gopal and Chester Sambrano. The pouring rain did little to stop these patrons from having a good time at the Tomac Festival at the Plymouth Recreation Ground. The order of the night was music and umbrellas, to which the A-team band capitalized. 
This was followed by an electrifying show in Winchester. And notwithstanding how wet the place was, Nyla Blackman brought the heat. What we say? Everybody say burn! And soon enough, it was time for the headline act. <laughs> The Grammy-winning Nigerian star did more than whet the appetite of those in attendance. He gave them the full course. Jerusalem, his band, his backup singers, all playing a part in making this performance one Tobago will never forget. And those present made sure of it. Chester Sambrano, CNC3 News. Looks good. As thousands get ready for Tobago Carnival, the TTPS is warning tonight there will be a heavy police presence and regular searches. At a news conference today, the Silver Commander for Tobago Mass said the Tobago Division has been boosted with several officers from Trinidad, mainly from the Garden Emergency Branch and the Interagency Task Force. Senior Superintendent Junior Benjamin admitted that murders, robberies and general larceny have increased on the island, and he is urging visitors and residents to be careful during the revelry. IATF officers have been in Tobago for the past two weeks and have arrested 18 people. Head of the task force, Senior Superintendent Oswin Subero explained what people can expect from tomorrow morning. And we will be out as early as 2 a.m., my entire team and myself, conducting foot patrols and the entire parade routes for the Juve, the Night Mass, and also the parade advance. So we're here to support we're just asking that people be a bit patient and understand um, the searches that may take place. Meanwhile, the Silver Commander warned that most of Tobago's robberies have been taking place during the night on the streets and in open places. So therefore, we want to encourage persons, again, to be very mindful of entering vehicles in these late hours and ensuring if you're doing so, make sure that someone at least is able to know, you know, the vehicle number, the registration number. Please, we want you to operate with great wisdom. Senior Superintendent Benjamin warned wrongdoers that if they are arrested during the celebrations, they will have to wait for October 31st for their court appearance. Finance Minister Kormenbert is outlining tonight several problems regarding this country's electricity production. He says these are much bigger problems as opposed to the country having cheap electricity rates. Keisha Carles Alonso has more in tonight's Business Watch. According to Finance Minister Kom Embert, some of the power producers in TNT have very inefficient plants. Speaking at a recent event hosted by the Energy Chamber, the minister says this is among some of the challenges facing the country's electricity sector. Minister Embert further explains. Yeah. So they use far more natural gas than they should. And that is a big problem. And we're having some issues with TGU as well, which is the most modern, most efficient plant, but they're having some issues with it. And when, when TGU goes down, we have to switch to the other older producers which can, who consume far more gas. Yes. And regarding electricity rates, Minister Imbert notes the Regulated Industries Commission is currently looking at this. However, he reiterates this may not be the real problem. TNTEC isn't paying NGC for gas. The price that the government buys the gas from the upstream producers is higher than the price it is billed to TNTEC. So those are the big issues that we have to deal with, not so much the 
cost of electricity to, to the consumer. consumer. We are subsidizing it far more than you think. Sure. It's, not, it's, not, it's not being charged at the appropriate rate. Okay. okay? So that's, that's the big, that's the elephant in the room we have to deal with. According to Minister Imbert, electricity is being subsidized far more than people think. And regarding other sources of power, the minister says government would like to get solar facilities going. In other business news, outgoing chair of the Energy Chamber, Dwight Mahabir, is calling for long-term investment in the country's energy sector. Without this, he adds, production will decline. And while the situation in Europe and the high-price environment offer key opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago, there are challenges. The declines in natural gas production over the past decade mean that we do not, that we have not been able to fully take advantage of this opportunity. At the end of 2021, the production of natural gas fell to just two and a half billion cubic feet per day, a long way below the peak production and installed capacity of about 4.1, 4.2 billion cubic feet per day. However, Mr. Mahaber notes there's positive news with potential projects coming on stream. He was also speaking at a recent event hosted by the TNT Energy Chamber. Keisha Kaulesa Alonso, CNC3 Business Watch. Welcome back, everyone. Our CNC3 News producer, Brent Pinero, recently visited Guyana on a trip hosted by Caribbean Airlines and the Guyana Tourism Authority. Last week, we showed Brent exploring some of Guyana's massive rivers. This week, it's all about exploring downtown Georgetown. Here's day two of his adventures. Two weeks ago, I boarded a flight to Guyana as part of the Caribbean Airlines farm tour. Now, get in gear because day two's itinerary has us heading downtown to see the sights. If we could ever make it through this traffic, I mean, why is this horse even here at this hour? Our first stop is at the Guyana National Park, where Jamal is. Getting some grass for the manatees. Yep, we're feeding manatees today. Well, that didn't take very long, so my turn. They're right here, right here. And if I take this little bush thingy, because they're vegetarian, they should, in theory, come eat the bush. There we go. There we go. We really want you to touch that. It's going to feel very rubbery. Yeah. It feels a little bit strange, almost like elephants. And although a certain person in our newsroom says they look like wet dashing, <coughs> uh, Rhea, I am not here for any manatee slander. I mean, look at that jub jub face. Manatees fed, we're off to see the rest of Georgetown. There's the Sea Wall, also known as the Sea Wall. There's the I Love Guyana sign for, you know, the gram. And then there's Yumaniyana, a 77 foot benar built using both modern and traditional indigenous techniques by the YY people. To learn more about the indigenous, their way of life, and their history, the Water Rock Museum should not be missed. A quick swing by St. George's Cathedral, one of the oldest wooden churches in the world, and then it's off to this honest human building that holds something rather interesting. So we're here at the Guyana National Museum, and behind these doors is something that is crazy. Just come, come watch it. This right here is a replica of a giant sloth. Standing approximately 15 feet tall and as heavy as an African elephant, these mega tea slots died out during the Ice Age. Here in Guyana, bones of one of these slots were discovered by miners in 1999. That find was even more remarkable because Guyana does not have many fossils due to its hot and humid climate. The good news is that this scary looking thing here was actually a herbivore. So you don't have to worry about getting eaten, but you might have to worry about getting stepped on. Next up, it shanters for something rather important, lunch, and curry is on the menu. So you can't come to Guyana without having curry, and we all know the curry chicken, chicken curry debate. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't have to worry about that. Instead, I got the seven curry, which is basically like a vegetarian meal. There's bhaji, there's pumpkin, um, chana, potato, eggplant, and a piece of uh, 
mango in here, and then there's mustard chopped. So we'll just give it a try. And take it in. There you go. Mm. It's nice. It's a little bit similar to Trini, Trini curry. I hope the guy don't hate me for that, but it is a little bit similar, and it tastes good. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Belly's full, it's on to the Starbrook Market with its iconic four-phase public clock. Here, you'll find practically any and everything, even wild animals, unfortunately. Our final stop for the day is the Botanical Gardens, where you'll find lots of peace and quiet and shade, thankfully, because it's been another hot and humid day here in Guyana. And just so you know, I may or may not have spotted a frog or two in this pond. You've been warned. Brent Panero for This Week in Travel, CNC3 News, Georgetown, Guyana. military museum in Chagaramas is being transformed into a haunted house for this Halloween weekend. A percentage of the proceeds will go towards repairing a part of the historical site that was destroyed in a fire earlier this year. Organizers Dream Life event told Carissa Lee that the event is sold out and patrons can expect to get their money's worth. From tragedy to the successful delivery of a baby, major incidents that happened this year at this place of history and inspired three young men to host a charity to save the site. But the execution may be a bit scary. You all covered the news with Miss Katian delivering the child here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are associates of us, right? Acquaintances. We came to share in celebration and we heard of the disaster. In April, the living quarters and the library of the museum were destroyed by a fire. Months later, when Rodrigo Cabrera visited, the damage was still evident, and he wanted to do something about it. I was like, hey, let me do a charity event, fundraiser for the museum, haunted house, Halloween event, Hollow Scream party. Proceeds from the ticket and bar sales at the party will go to the repair of the museum. Sales for the haunted house were used to create a scary scene for patrons. Everything that we used to design the museum, design the haunted house, came from ticket sales. So that's where we got the money to design the museum how we wanted it, and to pay the actors, to, to the equipment. Unfortunately, the weather gave those doing the scaring a fright, a financial one as many people called to cancel. And while they may not be able to reimburse them, they still plan to give them their money's worth. For those who live in certain areas where we may have flooding and who really cannot make it, we really trying our best to work with the museum to have a grace day, which is Monday, so that we can ha we could compensate for those who missed out. The team is called the Dream Life Events, a name they plan to live up to starting with this event, as they hired mainly unemployed actors to work in the haunted house, making their dreams come true, as they raise funds to bring life back into the museum and hopefully other historical buildings with the proceeds they generate from their events. Even I pledged my support. Tell us what we can expect. The unexpected, that's what you can expect. Any clowns? There isn't a party without clowns. Yeah, I, I know about that, I know about that, I know about that. Yeah, maybe I'll just contribute the money. Carissa Lee, CNC3 News. Let's quickly recap our headlines. South farmers rescue livestock from floodwaters following overnight rains. Fake documents flagged at the Shigonis Borough Corporation. Now one worker is receiving threats. In sports, the Gymnastics Federation faces up to the realities ahead as the Tamer Williams issue is finally settled. Sunshine kicking off the weekend, but the showers and thunderstorms return after lunch. That brings us to the end of the 7 p.m. news here on CNC3. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ria Rambali. I'm Ryan Beachu. I am Jassy Marie. I'm Kalein Hussain. Have a safe weekend.